Welcome to another episode of Voices of Recovery. I'm Tom Wolf, and my guest with me this week is Victoria. And Victoria, thank you so much for coming on and being with me this week. Absolutely. So today we're going to be talking about what we've been talking about the last few weeks, uh, which is recovery. We're going to be talking about uh, Victoria's journey into addiction, what life was like in addiction, what happened to her, how she uh, found recovery, what life is like in recovery now, what's wrong with the system right now, and what can we do that's better in the system right now to make it so we can access treatment and get more and more people into recovery and off the street and save lives. And uh, we're also going to ask Vicky what she's doing now. So do you want to go by Victoria or Vicky? Either one is fine. Either one is fine. Okay. <laughs> so Victoria, like myself, you are in recovery from addiction. Is that correct? I am. Great. How long have you been in recovery? Eight and a half years now. That's fantastic. That's great. Tell me a little bit about things that maybe happened maybe early in your life that led you into addiction to begin with. Yeah, I grew up upper middle class, but it wasn't like the white picket fence thing that everybody sees. I had, I'm an incest survivor. My father was an alcoholic, but the, I think the biggest thing that had an impact on me was that my mother developed lung cancer and she died when I was 11. I think that was a big impact. And I also had a twin that had Down syndrome, which I see as a very positive thing, but it was also a whole bunch of things that just led to me feeling, I don't know, not part of my family in some ways, I guess. I went to college. I was excited about that. I stayed I was living outside of Atlanta. I went to Georgia Tech for college. So not at home, but close enough. And then once I graduated from college, a friend of mine was living in California and she was like, hey, I, I was, let me back up. So I had friends that had moved out here and a friend of mine, I was co-oping at IBM while I went to school to pay for school. And one of my coworkers was like, hey, I have to go out to the Bay Area for a conference. She's like, as a graduation present, I'm going to pay for you to go out there. You can kick it with your friends and do whatever. And then when I'm done with my conference, we'll do the touristy thing. And I was like, great, sounds like a plan. A friend of, another friend of mine that was working out here said, hey, when you're coming out here, bring your resume and a suit. I got you an interview with my company. I want you to come work with us because the IT people here don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I was like, dude, I don't, ha I don't have a resume. I'm going to grad school. She's like, well, make one up and just be ready to interview. <laughs> I was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so I got the job actually. So I became the IT director for this small nationwide medical records company. My background was industrial engineering, but I had been working at IBM. So like computers and all that stuff was fine for me. And then when my twin died, it was really hard for me. I had already started messing around with drugs at that point. Like when we went out to, to party, we'd go out dancing all weekends, but really like when she died, I feel like it changed everything. I, I'm i sure it wasn't this dramatic, but in my mind, I went from, I went from like partying on the weekends with my friends to using meth daily, like overnight. I really feel like I started using meth a lot to, I was self-medicating for the depression. It really messed with my kind of sense of identity as a twin and all kinds of things. And I loved meth. I thought meth was the best thing ever. Being in the tech world, it allowed me to stay up and just hone in on different detail stuff and just dive into tech stuff. Things went on like that for a long time. I was working, but even working being high using meth daily. I remember being at work at different times, being in somebody's cube, 
like talking to people and realizing I was talking a lot about nothing and <laughs> just having to like, shut up and walk out of the the cubicle. I remember like doing lines on my badge in the bathroom. Oh. As my addiction progressed, I started smoking meth and I I got bold. I had worked up to where I had an office, so I'd be in my office smoking meth in my office, not really like on a Saturday when nobody was there, but like in the middle of the week, everybody's in the office, no fear, nothing like that. So I finally got fired from a job and it wasn't really, it wasn't like they caught me doing drugs, but it was like the associated things that come with doing drugs. So let me stop you there for a minute and ask about when you say about the, you got fired for some of the things that are associated with doing drugs, can you explain a little bit about that i figured out like little tricks so that i could be on time to work so like i figured out that if i didn't smoke until i was ready to walk out the door i could actually be on time if i smoked before i was ready to walk out the door i was late every single time i started taking longer lunches because i'd be smoking at lunch but it was really like the I don't know, like I felt like I was invincible. I felt that I was like, I was really good at my job, but I felt like I was better at my job than I probably was. Like I was in an irreplaceable kind of thing. But, and because of that, because I would work overtime, I was good at my job. I felt like I had the flexibility to do whatever I wanted to do, which, you know, that isn't the case with any job. And so I think things just, we had some changes in like the structure of the organization. I, I had been reporting to the deputy director and then they made me like a program manager and they wanted me to report to this new lady. I didn't like her because <laughs> I like she was questioning my authority and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, she was just doing her job. So I think she had asked me to do some things. I just didn't do them because I just chose not to do them. And after a couple of things, they were just like, you have to go. And I was like, All right. but be, and when after I did that, I what I was doing, I was managing an, a call center contract. The organization I worked for did managed a state mandated program called the Deaf and Disabled Telecommunications Program for the PUC. And the contractor that I had been managing was not in compliance um, with their contraction with the service level agreement that I had created <laughs> for them. And so when I got fired, they hired me on as a consultant for the next eight months to get them into compliance so that they wouldn't lose their contract. After that, I started selling drugs. And because I had always had good money, I had those relationships that it wasn't a big, it wasn't very hard for me to go from a very professional lifestyle to selling drugs. So you went from being employed full-time, regular job, to mm -hmm. selling drugs just as like the next progression in, mm -hmm. in what it is you're doing. And then all that time, of course, you were also using drugs yeah. and you were already, I guess you could say struggling with addiction at that point. Yeah. When that happened, it was like 2007, 2008. So it was during, I don't know if you remember, it was during that time where the job market was very, well, it was definitely an employer's market. There was a lot of people that were, had been doing professional jobs and now they were being replaced by people with masters or PhDs and stuff. So I, my self-esteem was tanked and it's crazy. Like before that, before I really got into doing drugs, I could go interview for a job that I didn't even really qualify for and get it. I yep. was just really good at selling myself. I was intelligent and that I didn't, at that point, I didn't have the confidence. I probably could have got a real job, a legal job, but I didn't have the confidence to like the fear of not being able to get one prevented me from even trying. It was just a much easier path since I was in that lifestyle. 
able to just start selling drugs. And he, like when, of course, I had a professional job. I knew people at work. I had kids. And so I was doing things like their school stuff and PTA and baseball, keeping scorebooks at ball games and stuff like that. But when you're even with that, as an addict, you, your world starts getting very small. And so the only people, and I would do these things like with my kids, but really the only people I ever really talked to outside of like people I was working with at work were other drug addicts or drug dealers. So it just gets really small. So I start selling drugs. At one point, an acquaintance of mine moved to Michigan and I started shipping meth to her because in, in Michigan, they were paying a lot more money <laughs> than people in, in California were paying. So I was making a lot of money shipping across state lines. And she was also getting shipments from other people. And I guess what really happened is one of the packages got intercepted and they, the feds picked her up and then they did a control buy with me. And a few months later, the feds came knocking on my door. So how long were you actually selling drugs from the time you started until the time the feds came knocking at your door? Probably like seven, seven and a half years. Wow. So you were doing that for that long and you were able to maintain a good lifestyle. Ups and downs. I wasn't living as good as I was when I had been working full time. And it's like, there's little things. It's not even just did you have a place to live? I never was homeless or anything like that, but there were things like the kind of people that my kids were starting to be exposed to, like crazy stuff. I remember one time my son was taking a Spanish class and one of my, my, my friends um, spoke, oh, he was a native Spanish speaker and I was like, hey, come help my kid with his homework. And when he got there, this is like the crazy stuff. When he got there, I was in the bathroom. And then when I came out, he was there helping Kaywana with his homework. And he, my little one was like, hey, what's this in the freezer? And he had brought a 40 ounce in the house. And I, I grew up with drunks. Right? I didn't allow alcohol in my house because I didn't want my kids to be around it. And I was like, man, you can't have bring that in my house. You know, the, you know, my rules. And in Spanish, he said, I can't bring a beer in your house, but you've got four pounds in your closet. <laughs> <laughs> but that made very much sense to me at the right. time. It's funny how when we're in our addiction, things that make sense to us don't really make sense out in, in the rest of the world. And it's funny how that it causes that kind of disconnect where you start rationalizing things and you, you start making these decisions that you think are logical that to someone on the outside would look and say, that's bananas, that right. you could have four pounds of meth in your closet, but you won't allow a beer in the house. And obviously you have reasons and those reasons are valid. But if someone doesn't know, you know, what it's like to be in that position where you're struggling with addiction, where you have... A, almost like a different set of rules that you live by than, yeah, than people that aren't. It's a, it makes for an interesting time. Can you tell me a little bit more about maybe a, one or two incidents that you would describe as being that crazy time or that chaos time? I remember one time I went to cop with a friend and I was on the back of his motorcycle. We were going down, the cops got behind us, but I had... I probably had two pounds in my, in a backpack I was wearing. So I was like, dude, we can't get caught by the cops. And so we went on a high speed chase, got away. And I, <laughs> you know, that should have been a deterrent right there, but it wasn't. But the, the messed up thing was like two weeks later, that same friend got in another high speed and died. So those kinds of things happened all the time. There weren't, weren't that many female dealers in my circles. So most of the people that I dealt with were men. A lot of the situations that I was in, thinking back, I could have been killed at any time for a lot of different reasons in a lot of different situations. I was, 
Betty Crocker, like I'd wake up, make my kids breakfast, get them off to school, do whatever I did, make dinner, do their homework with them, go to ball practice, put them to bed, and then I'd be out running in the streets at night. And and was this was this in the Bay Area that this was happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was in the Bay Area. The now I look at what's going on in San Francisco and I, I joke with my friends, but I was like, we got out of the game way too early. <laughs> yeah, because it's off the hook now. Tell me about what happened when the feds came knocking at your door. What was that process like and how did you feel? The feds picked me up. They took me down to the federal building. Then they took me to Santa Rita. I I had not dealt with anybody that had been, you know, indicted by the feds. All of the people I knew had been caught state cases, county cases, whatever. And there's something really ominous seeing a piece of paper that says United States of America versus Victoria Westbrook. Like there's, damn, the whole United States. Like I haven't even been to most of the United States. Wow. The whole United States is against me. Wow. Okay. And it's crazy, like you, Santa Rita, I don't, is the county jail for Alameda County, and it sucks. You're in your cell most of the time. There's no going outside is like a, a cement room with a grate as a ceiling. I was really fearful, but the biggest thing was like, I really missed my kids. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then the magistrate gave me the opportunity to go to treatment. And honestly, I didn't go to treatment to get clean. I went to treatment to get the hell out of Santa Rita. I would have done anything to get out of Santa Rita. And how long did you sit in Santa Rita before you saw the magistrate and they offered you that opportunity for treatment? The minute they picked me up, they took me to court. I met my public defender for the court, but my case was really out of Michigan. They just picked me up in, in Oakland. So then I went to Santa Rita. The next time I went to court, they were, tr the magistrate suggested this, but like the, the, the district attorney for the feds, they were trying not to let me go to treatment. Like I was some big, huge kingpin. And the district attorney in it's very interesting, like the cultural differences from the Bay Area to like back east, right? The more further east you go, the more conservative the the federal courts get. But finally, and then I had to work out, you have to, I had to do an assurity bond, which is basically like my partner and a friend had to basically sign their life away if I absconded, basically. That took a few weeks going back and forth the court and it's just a very different world <laughs> going to the federal court i remember one time because the feds you wait you go to a holding early in the morning waiting to be picked up everybody's there getting picked up to go to different courts and we were usually picked up as the feds we were usually picked up maybe i don't know the third group out and the marshals were amazing. Like they were such a big contrast compared to the COs at Santa Rita. Like they were just, they were nicer. They were more respectful. But this one time, and they'd always come like in their little khakis and their little dark blue or black polo shirts. And this one time they came, but they were accompanied by these, a couple of other officers that were in suits and it's funny one of the one of the marshals i called charming deputy charming because he was hella cute i was like charming what's up with the suits and he's like need to know westbrook need to know i was like all right but we were going to pick up this guy uh, on the men's side and they wouldn't leave this guy's side and i was like wow i wonder what the hell he did but then when we got to downtown to go to the courts they put you underneath in in cells but they had so many men on the men's side that some of the guys had to be put on the female side and one of them um was this black guy i was like what's up with i was like what i was like what are you doing with them because everybody else looked like 
homies, but not like homies from the Bay Area. They look like homies from like Salinas with like tats all over their heads and like serious people <laughs> that you would really yeah. want to be like, like serious of. gangsters kind of right yeah. yeah and he was like man i'm from santa rosa you grow up in santa rosa you grow up around the homies and seriously he's like, i know it's bullshit you hear this a lot i'm really here because of one phone call <laughs> like wow <laughs> dude. he's like, yeah he's like i'm looking at like decades because of a phone call and i was like yeah i get it at the time, I didn't realize about sentencing guidelines, what the difference was with the feds and the state. But I had, that would come. <laughs> My fear of what was going to happen would come later. So I did get out of, I did get out of Santa Rita to go to treatment. And this is one of the things that like, I would have never, ever picked to go to treatment because the people in my circle the only time they stopped using is when they would go to prison and let's keep it real most of the time, not even then, or when they died, right? Like people just didn't quit. So why would I bother? It would be a total waste of time. So if I hadn't have gotten indicted by the feds, I would have never gone to treatment on my own. And like forevermore, I will be eternally grateful for the feds for that. You and I both know that there's a whole movement that's happening right now across this country to move away from the idea of mandated treatment. And you hear uh, a lot of activists talk about coerced treatment as carceral and all these different things. And we shouldn't force anybody to go to treatment. And I, I was, I don't know about you. It sounds like your story is kind of like mine, but way worse than mine actually, uh, in that you were offered a choice, right? Uh, like a way out. And that, that's how I was too. I was sitting in jail and I was offered a choice, a way out. That's a whole lot different than being mandated to treatment. And like you said, you would have never gone to treatment. I wouldn't have ever gone to treatment either. I would be dead right now because I would have just kept using fentanyl and th there you go. I was still pretrial, right? Like I had no idea what I was even looking at. The feds are a total get, different get down right. as far as what happens. It was just to get out of Santa Rita. <laughs> I just, like, I didn't even know what I was looking at with the feds. So I go to treatment and it's so funny. Like, I remember walking into that house, like I was a boss walking into a house full of Knox. Like I didn't smoke dope for breakfast every morning. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like I was so, I was other than, I was better than, I was something different than what these people were. When in actuality, I was no different. I just had a different job at the time. Right. And I, I got to the point, I don't know, probably within the first month realizing like, maybe just maybe if, if I hadn't been doing drugs, I definitely wouldn't have been selling drugs and I wouldn't have been gotten, I wouldn't have gotten in when indicted by the feds. But I really, like, I couldn't, I didn't believe that people were actually getting clean and they were happy about it. I thought I, if I ever stopped using drugs, if I was ever able to stop using drugs, that I would wake up every morning and be miserable because I would want to be using, but I couldn't for some reason. And it's funny, the people that would go through the program, our program was a six-month program, and then once you moved out of residential treatment, you had to continue to do aftercare for a year before you could graduate. But um, so people would, after that had moved out of the house or that had even graduated, would come back and share, check in with the house, see how, you know, share things. And all the time I would always like pull them aside because they'd all talk about how, yeah, things are great and being in recovery is wonderful. And yeah, things come up and it's so much better than it was. And I'd be like, okay, yeah, okay. So like, I'd all, I didn't believe it. I'd be like, okay, like there's no counselors. Tell me what's really going on. Tell me how you're miserable. Tell me how like all you can think about is using drugs. Like you'd rather, whatever's going on, you'd still rather be doing drugs or do, running in the street, doing whatever you were doing. Like, just, just keep it real. And they were like, no, Vicky, this is the truth. I'm like, okay, whatever. And then, and again, like, I was like, yeah, I'm in treatment because of the feds. But then, because in the 
the treatment program would be like, there's no bars on these doors and windows. You can walk out at any time. But in my mind, I was like, yeah, I could walk out the front door, but the marshals would pick me up before I even made the corner. And then one day I saw, <laughs> then one day one of the other Fed clients walked out the front door and I was like, oh, okay, I guess this really is a choice. It's maybe it's not the best choice options that I would want in my life right now, but I am choosing to stay here and gaining that understanding that, yeah, it really was my choice. I could choose to go back to jail if that, and some people do. Some people, I was in jail with some people that were offered to go to treatment. They were doing state cases and they didn't go. They chose to stay in jail because they, they had no, they were like, no, I'm good. I'll just stay here and do it and get my time yeah. done and get out. But then like I started really trying to work in the program and doing what I was supposed to do. And, you know, there's something to be said about being in an environment with people who have higher expectations for your life than you do. Holding you accountable, calling you on your stuff. Um, because especially at that point in my life, right? Like when you're a drug dealer, nobody calls you on shit, the, at least the people around you, because they're always trying to get something from you. So it was a totally different kind of experience for me. I did well in the program. I crossed over into aftercare. I got a job at a restaurant. I was still on pretrial, going to NA meetings, doing my aftercare. And, but wait, let me back up for a minute. So while I was in treatment, it was funny one day, like probably three weeks into me landing in the house, I had to go get formerly arraigned in Michigan. And it's, it was really funny. Like I couldn't even go to the bathroom by myself in treatment yet, but I had to go get on a plane and go to court, meet my real public defender and get formally arraigned. And it, that was really, I wasn't really afraid of it until I got there. And the, the magistrate was like, why do you need to go to treatment? You'll be sober in jail. You'll be sober in prison. Like why? Because wow. in, the, in that district, they don't send people to treatment pretrial. They send them to treatment if they get out and then they start using once they've done their time. But luckily, he let me come back and continue with treatment. And the other thing that's different with the feds is the public defenders are really good. Like my public defender was in the process of trying to become a judge. <laughs> so they're very, like he was really good at his job. And so all I wanted to know from him is like, what was I looking at? Like I'm one of these kind of people, like I can deal with anything, but I need to know what it, what to, what I have to put my brain around to be able right. to prepare for something. And he couldn't tell me at the time I go back to treatment. I'm doing the program. That's all I want to know from him. And then one day I call, I, he calls and he said, okay, he said, I finally have your guidelines. And I was like, oh, okay, good. He's I was like, what I said, tell it, tell me what's going on. He said, He's like, you're looking at 24 to 27. I was like, months? Great. He was like, no, honey, years. I was like, wow. I didn't kill anybody. He's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean 24 to 27 years? Like, I'm not El Chapo. <laughs> I right. not anything that big, right? Come on, dude. I used half my product. What are you talking about? He said, Vicky, don't worry. You're not going to do that. I was like, dude, if I do you know how old I am? Like I was in my forties. I was like, if I did, my people don't li live that long. Right. If I do half of that, I'm going to die in prison. He was like, no, just trust me. I was like, trust you. I don't even know you. What are you talking about? Dude, I was devastated. I yeah. was devastated. I was like, oh my God, I'm finally getting my shit together. And now I'm going to die in prison. Like this, what the fuck? Um, it was disturbing. But I didn't bounce from treatment. I didn't abscound. I was just like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is what I got to figure out. Right. I ended up 
Like I said, I got out of treatment. I got a job at a restaurant, going to like NA meetings, staying in recovery, not doing anything I wasn't supposed to do, not hanging out with anybody I used to hang out. And I finally go get sentenced. And it's funny because my lawyer was like, I had to go back to Michigan to get sentenced. He's just, he's like, all you need is a one-way ticket because when you get sentenced, they're going to take you into custody. So just bring whatever you're going to wear. And if there's something extra, I can ship it back to your house. I was like, right. so I say my goodbyes to everybody. I still have no idea what, what I'm going to, luckily at the time they were doing like a two point deductions. It was some kind of a legal thing that was happening. Not that that was going to help a whole hell of a lot, but I ended up getting sentenced to 57 months and the magistrate, they give you an option to talk when I, what I was, what I really talked about was like, like what I was really most ashamed of is what I had done to my community. Like you justify things. Like I had people I was selling drugs to that they would bring their kids with them and I would have them at my house. I would end up taking them with my kids to go do stuff or I'd feed them or whatever. And I felt like I was doing something really great, but what I was doing was really destroying their families' lives you know, by selling to them. And I've said this to other people and they're like, well, if they didn't get it from you, they would have got it from somebody. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Cause addicts will do what they got to do, but that still doesn't mean that that I have no responsibility in what I had done to my community. And 57 months <laughs> was a long time. And I remember during this time, there, one of our, like an extended family member caught a case, got five years for a gun charge with the feds. And I saw him before he was turning himself in and he was like, he was all happy. And I'm like, dude, how are you in a good mood? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, you're about to go walk someplace, walk to someplace, go in a door, and then you're not going to be able to leave for five years. Like, how do you, he's like, Vicky, that's nothing. He's like, five years is nothing. <laughs> he's like, I can do that standing on my head. I was like, dude, yeah. Like I couldn't even imagine what that, that whole thing, but I did, I got sentenced to 57 months and remarkably the sentencing judge, but this was the funny part, right? So we're going to get, I was asking my lawyer on the way to get sentenced. I was like, Hey, what's the, why am I going here? As opposed to the other courtroom that we were at. And he's like, Senten sentencing judges and magistrates are different. Sentencing judges are appointed by presidents. And I was like, Oh yes. Who appointed my judge? He said, Bush. I am so <laughs> fucked. <laughs> So are you sure we can't get another one of these judges? He's like, oh my God, I'm screwed. So, no, so you went to federal prison then? Yeah. He, and like, I, I talked about being ashamed and because I had talked about being ashamed of what I had done in my community, he said uh, the whole time he had ever been on the bench, he had never heard anybody use those words. And because of that, he let me self-surrender which is crazy because I didn't have a way home <laughs> at this point. I had to call my brother and say, Hey, I need a plane ticket home so I can go home for another month and a half until I get my orders. So yeah, I ended up going to prison after being clean. And you know, it's something I think being in recovery really saved my life in prison. I made a very conscious, I didn't know what to expect. I had never been to prison. And the only people that I had known that had gone to federal prison were guys. And it's a very different experience for men in the federal prison system. It's much more political for them. So I could, like, I, I listened to their stories and thought, but it wasn't anything like that where I was at. It's much less political in the female prisons. But yeah, I had to go turn myself in and. It was crazy. It was a crazy experience. I made a very conscious decision that I was going to be a better person on the other side of prison. I didn't, I, 
honestly, like, I didn't even know what that was going to look like. And I sure in hell didn't know how I was going to do it, but that's what was going to happen. And I believe that very conscious decision really saved my life. It and gave me enough agency in a powerless situation to make that time worth it. So I, the, one of my sentencing guidelines was that I do this program called RDAP. And it's like a residential drug program where everybody that's in the program lives in one housing unit. It's a lot of programming. It's very strenuous. You're in, you go to chow and you get little packets of sugar on your tray that they give you for coffee or whatever. If you don't use them, everybody took them back to their room. If we got caught with one of those sugar packets, we'd get kicked out of the program because it was stealing from the prison. Wow. Even though we were just going to put it in the trash, it, we weren't allowed to take it back to our rooms. So some of the other things that other things that other prisoners did to make their time easier in prison, we couldn't do because if we got caught, we would get kicked out of the program. And if you, but, and that was, if you successfully complete the program, you get a year off, up to a year off your sentence and at least six months in a halfway house. So that's 18 months that you weren't going to be in prison. But I did RDAP. I did really well. I became a big sister, a senior sister, like part of the leadership for the community. I took every psychology class they offered, like numerous CBTs, DBTs, self-esteem, trauma in life, seeking safety, transactional, anything they offered, I took. And I also got to work like one-on-one -on -one with a psychologist. Because there was a lot of things that I hadn't dealt with at this point. I hadn't dealt with being an incest survivor. I hadn't dealt with my twin dying. I hadn't dealt with my mom dying. I hadn't dealt with any of that stuff. And it was really good being able to talk with her one-on-one -on -one because, like, things are different. <laughs> there was one point I was like, like, I'm depressed. I think I need to be on antidepressants. She's like, Vicki, you're not depressed. I said, I am. And she's like, no, honey, you're just sober. I'm like, dude, I get so tired at the end of the day. All I want to do is sleep. He's like, Vicki, you work in the kitchen. You're in the kitchen at 430 in the morning. <laughs> like, of course, you're tired at the end of the day. She's like, this is what normal people feel like. Like, if this is being sober, man, it's rough. So like, just getting to be because, like, I had been doing meth for over 20 years. I didn't know, I couldn't even tell you what normal felt like anymore. You get so used to the drug, especially with meth, with the dopamine release in your brain. Yes. And then having that dopamine deprivation in your brain. That's actually like a, that's actually a real thing you know, that really affects your mood and can send people, especially people in early recovery from meth, into this black hole where it yes. feels like depression, but really what it is is that your brain is trying to learn how to re-regulate itself again. Wow, that's amazing. How, how long, okay, let's put it this way. When did you get out? I got out in September of 2016. And that's getting out. I hadn't, I didn't smoke even cigarettes the whole time I was in prison. I did really good. <laughs> I didn't, you know, there's a room for that. There were people getting high in prison. I didn't do that for sure. And it's funny because they, I was, I went to Victorville. I self-surrendered in Victorville. And then to do the R, they didn't have RDAP there. So to do the RDAP program, they, I had to go to Phoenix, Arizona. My family didn't have money to come visit me in Phoenix. And it's funny, the people, there were people that had come back to prison after being, had been released or whatever. And all they talked about was like how rough it was going to be. You were not going to be able to get a job. Housing is going to be a problem. People are going to deal with you crazy. Your PO is going to be a dick, like all these things. And I was like, I was getting out of prison at 50. I was scared to death. If they would have let me smoke a cigarette and see my kids, the feds could have kept me longer. I was that afraid of what was going to happen when I got out and what I was going to have to deal with. Um, my kid was about to go to college the next year. Like, all I could think of was like, how am I going to make enough money to send this kid to school? Like, it, it was crazy. When even that, people don't think about what happens to kids 
when people get locked up. Like I was in prison with women that there was a couple of women that were pregnant. One woman, she went to go have her child and two days later, she came back to the prison without her baby. Luckily she had family that came to pick the child up, but there are women that that happens to, they're in a different state. They don't even live there. They yeah. don't have family to come pick the child up. Some women were in prison. They had no idea where their kids were. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And that very conscious decision about, you know, I said it gave me agency to make the best and put, use my time. Because what happens when people get put in powerless situations, they tend to, re, you know, respond in one of two ways. Either they push it and, and struggle against the power structure. And I saw women who did that, many to the point of getting more time on their sentence. And then, or they resolve themselves into this like victim stance. And I saw women who did that. As time went by, they became more and more withdrawn. They became more bitter, more hopeless. And I do believe that, that decision gave me agency to keep me out of those two realms. But yeah, getting out of prison was scary. And it's crazy because people who don't go to prison, they think that once you're out of prison, everything's great with the world. But they, it's not. I went to a place in San Francisco to a halfway house. There were 20 women and 185 men that just got out of prison. So you can imagine what that environment was like. You were a walking vagina. Guys would come up and talk to you about the craziest shit, not even knowing your names. And luckily I did boundary work in prison. I was doing boundary work with a lot of women. I had no idea if that shit was really going to take mm -hmm. when I got confronted with men. I'm glad to say that it did, but it's, you get out of prison, you already feel like you're behind, right? Like you now you're painfully aware that you not only lost those years while you were in prison. I lost all those years really of while I was out there using and selling and doing all that stuff. I definitely wasn't where I was supposed to be in life. So like you, you have this thing where things aren't, you feel like things aren't happening fast enough and things are happening way too fast all at the same time. Like it's overwhelming. I didn't feel like my case managers helped me at all. I felt like all they were really interested in was doing paperwork so they'd get paid for my body in a bed. But the ex-lifers that got out before me, they really saved. They really helped and saved me. They were there to like talk me down when I was like, fuck this. I'd rather just go do my last six months in prison and get out. Or they were there to give me game about all the resources that they had already learned about in the community, where to go get different stuff. So that was helpful. And so, all, all that time you were in state, you stayed in recovery that whole time. Yes. So the I've whole never, time you were in I've prison, never relapsed. Everything, you never mm -hmm. relapsed. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say that because of you being in recovery, being sober, the tools that maybe you learned in recovery that they alluded to it as your time in jail too, in prison, that it helped you navigate through that life better yeah, than, it, than otherwise? Yeah, it absolutely did because I don't know how to explain this. What part of being in recovery is like learning how to be held accountable. So that doesn't go away. I'm probably one of the more, more honest people you'll ever meet right now just because of that kind of thing. I'm pretty easy and able to like admit to things that I'm doing wrong and not, it's okay because I can't fix stuff I can't admit to. I still have work to do on myself. Like it doesn't stop. <laughs> you just right. find new stuff. Like you think you're, get, you're getting close to the end. You just uncover more <laughs> stuff that you have to work on. Right. Thankfully, because that journey I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade because I'm excited about growth and development. I got a job when I got to the halfway house. I also, as a fed client in a halfway house, you're still considered in custody. So you have to have real reasons to get out of the house. You can't just come and go as you please and be back by a, a curfew time. 
So you could get out of the house for work or school or training or doctor's appointments, things like that. So there was a training program across the street called Code Tenderloin that was like a job readiness thing. And I was like, I don't really need that, but whatever. It's a good reason to get out of the house. But the program really helped me. It got my four-page resume down to one page. It helped me stop calling people blood <laughs> when I was talking to them. It, but what it really did for me is it helped me realize that my past shapes me, but it doesn't define me unless I let it. And that's not to say that my life got easy, right? My right. felonies disappeared because they sure in the hell didn't. When you have that understanding, you move in the world in a different way than I did even before that. I continued to work at the restaurant. I graduated from the job readiness. I started doing their coding class, not because I wanted to be a developer. I'm geeky. I like data and technical stuff. But again, it was another good reason to get out of the house. And it was interesting and fun to learn. Um, and the director at the time from Co Tenderloin was like, hey, you want to come work part-time with us to do like some admin and data stuff for us? I was like, sure. And like a month and a half later, she said that she was getting a job that she had applied for with the city like a year before. And she recommended to the board that I take over as the director of programs and operations. And I was really like, wow, okay. And I, I had the skill set from my earlier professional life. Right. But I also had this passion of working with the people that came through the door. We were a very small organization. It was very small at that time. So it sounds very, the title sounds super impressive, but it just means I did everything from grant writing budgets, managing the contract with the city, applying for other funding, teaching classes, doing case management with clients, building relationships in the community. And it's so funny because like we would go, we would take classes to the different tech companies and to expose them to different, both technical jobs and non-technical jobs at these companies. Cause they, the tech, let's just keep it real. The tech companies were where the real money was at, right? And we didn't want to just get people jobs. We wanted to get people careers and just expose them to different things. So, and I was always very vocal about my addiction, being in recovery, going to prison, selling drugs, like all of that. And one day, one of this, one of my students was like, Ma, why do you tell people that, man? Like, you could pass. And I was like, pass? And I was like, what are you talking about? Because like, when I think of passing, I think of like a racial thing. He's like, nobody would ever know that you were a drug dealing felon drug addict. I was like, right. I was like yeah, I was like, but that's exactly why I, do, I am vocal because they need to understand that this is what it looks like on the other side of going to prison. This is what it looks like on the other side of a 20 year meth addiction that we can change. We can become productive and pro-social members of society. We can regain purpose and meaning in our life. That's right. And yeah, I'm the same way. So I've gotten to the point now where people look at me and I'll tell them my story and they'll be like, I, I just don't see it, man. I just don't see it. Right. And I'm like, what do you need to see? Do you need me to show you my arms with all my scars and my blown out veins to prove it to you? What do you need to see? Addiction doesn't discriminate in that way, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Our systems that are in place definitely discriminate, but addiction itself doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care if you're white, black, rich, poor, but you can fall into that trap and you can be anybody. Look at all the movie stars that are always talking about, oh, I checked myself into a rehab. It affects everybody and that people understand that because there's this weird kind of view that the general public has about, oh, a drug addict is a homeless guy living in a tent. And that's only a small percentage of people that struggle with addiction. The much larger percentage are people that are actually functioning in mm -hmm. their life, but then they have this monkey on their back of addiction that eventually catches up to you. And I don't care what anybody says, it catches up to you one way or the other because if it doesn't screw up your life some way, it kills you in the end. So it all, it always wins if you don't, if you don't address it 
by seeking out recovery eventually at some point. Yeah, no, I was, I, I was, a, I, I wore like a badge. I was a maintenance addict for many years um, until I wasn't, <laughs> right? Until right. it started destroying my life. And even then losing a job, I was never homeless, but there were times where housing instability happened or being in certain situations like with that addict brain, I was always like making justifications, going around and over and up, but never dealing with what the real cause of the problem was, which was my addiction. I thought I was going to die smoking meth, and I was fine with that. Right. Yeah, I was uh, of the thinking on my head on the street is that I didn't care if I, I didn't want to overdose and die of overdose, but I didn't care if I did. Yeah. You because know, I had just. I was so screwed up and given up so much hope. So let me ask you two, two last questions, Vicki. What's your relationship like with your family today? Oh, yeah. No, it's great. Going to prison, you miss things with your kids, especially. And like going to prison, I, I remember having crazy con some crazy conversations with my son, particularly because I like at that point, I the only thing that I could offer him was the truth. I could only talk to him truthfully. If he asked a question, I would do my best to, before I went to prison, while I was in prison. And so even though I wasn't with him all the time and it was hard on both of us, our relationship changed in some ways because he knows and he knows today that he can talk to me and that I'll tell him what I know to be true. And we have a lot of really deep discussions in my house about drugs, about race, about the criminal justice system. And so luckily they're, they're really good, right? Like my kids, they're like, mom, like, they're like, mom, we all make mistakes. It's okay. Like they, they don't have any resentments against me. They miss me. They missed me while I was gone, but they're glad that um, I'm out and I'm doing what I'm doing. And I, I think we're, we're really close. They're me and their father are super, super close. He's my best friend and it is what it is. It's, it was a portion of our lives and now it's something different. And it's interesting because my, my one son, like he smokes weed on and off and he's 22 and I'm like, son, like, I can't tell you. I was a drug addict. I did dope every day, but all I can tell you is please stop smoking weed until you're like 26. <laughs> Just give your right. brain time your brain to a chance. and then you can smoke <laughs> your brains out. Like, that's all I want to you know. I'm like, you, and you have to be weary. You know, but the fact that I was an addict makes you so much more likely to be an addict. You have to right. really pay attention to that. So we're, we can have those kind of candid conversations. In fact, he just, he, He's at Sac State now, and he just came home uh, yesterday for the summer. And I was like, son, I know, I know you're grown and stuff, but I'm super excited to see you. And he's like, mom, I'm so excited to be home. I'm, I love being around you and dad. So it feels really good. He's super proud of what I do in my job and my work and what I do in community. It's nice. I'm super proud of you too, because I know the kind of work that you do <laughs> and everything you're telling me is like just this big tribute to, to how human beings have something it within them that can be harnessed to change and turn their lives around for better. And I always say that it, it's like a tribute to recovery. And this is leads me to my next question about what's going on right now on the streets of California. Not just San Francisco, but Oakland and Fresno and Sac and LA and it's and, and it's spread. It's in, up in Oregon now and Seattle and everything with this drug crisis, this overdose crisis, and it's up into Canada. I think I had a, a doctor of addiction medicine told me that the epicenter of the opioid crisis in North America is actually Vancouver, and San Francisco is like a close second behind wow. it. And, and I believe that there's. It's so part of it, I think, is the, the drugs, the synthetic drugs, the illicit fentanyl that's out there, the new kind of meth that they're, they're making it without ephedrine anymore. So they're using a different chemical composition, and it yeah. seems to be driving this kind of meth induced psychosis. And yeah. then they've 
So systematically in California and Oregon and Washington too have removed accountability from the equation, taking law enforcement out, especially in Oregon, they've taken law enforcement out of the equation for trying to help manage this problem. And that's, if you want to do that, that's cool, but you better replace it with something. Right. And, and I think that's a, a, a big issue. And I, I need to ask you, what do you think we need to do out there, especially in San Francisco, where we have this wide open drug scene, where we have hundreds of the Hondos, the Honduran dealers out there, man, I'll say it, that's who they are. They're organized, they're out there, they're slinging. They're pulling kilos of fentanyl off the street every month. And what do you think we need to do? For real, what do you think we need to do? I don't think we need to put people in, in jail for being addicts, right? No. But Agreed. if you're an addict and you're out there breaking the law, you need to go to jail. You need to be held accountable. That shouldn't be the excuse or the reason. Right. Our children, our families shouldn't have to live stepping over or walking past people using on the street, defecating on the street, stepping over syringes. It's crazy that that is okay. And the open air drug markets, I, it's unbelievable to me being in, being a dealer in my past, I did everything in my power to be under the radar. I used to think about different ways to hide the dope. Like from everything from like having like many safes around me or like putting things in addressed envelopes and like just like all kinds of crazy drug dealer bullshit. Right. Hiding stuff in those like little tide boxes so like the dogs wouldn't be able to smell it if they just like if somebody has 15 packages of Tide in their car. It's just crazy, dude. <laughs> But, now, it's, now it's just in the open, right? Dude, like, I'm like, they don't even try to hide it. They don't yeah. even try to, like, make it seem like something. Like, if there's no mistake in what they're doing. None at all. And I think that's crazy. Like, they need to be arrested. They need to go to prison. They need to go to prison. And if it means them getting deported, they know what they're doing. They're making that people don't understand they're making thousands of dollars a day right these aren't people that aren't being fed come on man these aren't human trafficking victims that's it what i was going to ask you that whole argument about uh, these people have been trafficked against their will under penalty of death to sell drugs what do you think about that no Honestly. i don't i don't from my interaction with people on this, that is not what's happening. Agreed, I'm not saying not. that there haven't been some kind of drug dealers that might have been human traffic, but the ones that are out there right now, that is not the case. That Agreed. is absolutely not the case. They, like you said, it, they're, they're organized, they're a machine. They are an actual machine. These people come into work, into, they don't live in the city. They come to work like other people come to work in the city. It's crazy every day have shifts <laughs> like it's it's yeah people don't get it um and, and it's funny that people it has to be people like you and me to speak up and say stuff like that because the politicians are, are and, and look i understand that local officials like su you know, county supervisors and the mayor that's already like the lowest level of government man we need to take this up to the state level we need to start going up to sacramento talking to state senators to the governor and then up to the federal level as well, because they don't have a clue. The media clearly doesn't have a clue. You have a whole subset of the political spectrum that's saying that's not actually happening. And then a bunch of activists behind them saying it's not actually happening because they're trying to justify this decriminalization narrative. And I'm for decriminalization in that Me I'm too. with you that drug addicts don't, jail isn't necessarily the place for them. But right. we're talking about we're talking about an organized drug dealing syndicate that's operating in plain sight in San Francisco, and it's operating in Seattle, it's operating uh, in Vancouver, which is not even our country, and right. certainly operating in L.A. and uh, and what are we going to do about that? And that it seems like that we're way behind on that, and at the same time we're wrestling with the issue of drug interdiction. That's what they call it with the DEA and stuff. As to as as far as how do we go about doing that? 
and it's it's but people don't understand the drugs are different right with fentanyl with the way meth is made now they could make that stuff around the clock like it's an unlimited supply that is coming into this country you can make meth in your backyard you just right. have to dig a hole how many guys i was in rehab with that would say well, if this doesn't work out i can just go home and dig a yeah. hole that means yeah. that they're going to start their own meth lab in their backyard and it's right. you know people need people don't understand that and it's, it's frustrating but at the same time that's why i'm talking to you that's why we're both outspoken about this because people need to know. And then once they know all of that and their eyes are wide open, if they make certain decisions from there, at least they're doing it with good information and the yeah. truth. Right? And it's and it's the whole kind of th culture within San Francisco. I get mad, right? Like the housing first model. Like we know from the pandemic that housing isn't the solution because that's where the majority of the overdoses happened in shelter in place hotels and in SROs, right? So obviously housing is not the solution to everything, right? If somebody is using or having unmanaged mental illness before they get housed, putting them into a house is not gonna solve that. They call it housing first with supportive services, but what they don't tell you is that the supportive services are not mandatory. What they also don't tell you is that the supportive services are understaffed. They're not yes. generally, there's not a lot of great programs out there anyway. So I worked as a case manager in permanent supportive housing. We were always understaffed all the time. Three case managers for 103 residents. Housing first it has to be scaled up correctly, I think yes. is the thing. And if it's scaled up correctly as it's on paper, but it hasn't been scaled up correctly and no more so than it, and then San Francisco is a prime example of that. And I just, it's sad because people are dying as a result. So now we've crossed this line where we're just warehousing people. Yeah. Those, those shelter in place hotels, we're warehousing people and we're letting them shoot dope. Yeah. And, and even during the peak of COVID, they said, oh, you're quarantined in those hotels. That's what they told the media. But you and I both know that they could sign out for one hour a day and they could go out and score their dough and right. go back to their room. Nobody talks about that. No. And I, I think that should be talked about and people need to know. So Yeah. And I the other thing is I feel they want to frame everything as like the compassionate response. But I'm sorry, this if people look at the people using on the street, that is not using with dignity right? People are like, either like statues, they're nodding out, they're not conscious. Women using on the street, it's very dangerous for them. Mm -hmm. Women are getting attacked and raped all the time. Mm -hmm. And people passing you, they have open wounds on their body that aren't being taken. Like, this is not compassionate care. We're not talking about putting people in jail. We're talking about giving them treatment. I can tell you for sure that I have no fear of overdosing because I don't use, right? right. That's And we're not giving people a chance to get their lives back. Harm reduction keeps people alive, but it te doesn't teach them how to live. It right. doesn't let them actually live. I was at a conference the other day and I was talking about the drugs and we were saying that we've gotten so focused on the individual when it comes to harm reduction that we're not we're not taking a step back and looking at the whole community and how we can reduce harm to the community. Right. And that's the big thing. Breaking up the open drug market is harm reduction. It's not rocket science, but we keep trying to find a different solution politically that doesn't exist. And I think that's where we're failing. Would yeah. you agree with I I totally agree. And I, I, but it is sad because our community is being devastated. They've turned the Tenderloin into a containment zone. Yeah. Well, it's spilled out into it's other parts of the city out, now. Right? right. And it's really sad. And it's, it's, we both love San Francisco. We got love for the city. We both grew up here in the Bay Area. This is kind of San Francisco's our hometown, more or less. Yeah. So it's sad to see it, see it go down. Victoria, I can't thank you enough for the time that you spent with me today. 
just listening to your story is just amazing and it needs to be told and it needs to be told to a lot of people they need to hear it because i think you you really struck a great balance between the understanding that we need some kind of reform to give people an opportunity to change without throwing out all the accountability altogether and i've always been a big proponent in recovery of that you know accountability is one of the cornerstones of recovery and I sat there and I talked to a bunch of people the other day and I said that to them and they were like a light bulb went on all their heads that, that you can ask anybody in this room that's in recovery and they'll tell you that accountability is one of the main things. And we've completely removed that for so many people that are in their addiction and for a lot of them it's become a death sentence. I really hope that we can make our leaders and the community listen and hear our perspective because I think it needs to be told. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. So this is Voices of Recovery. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you in a week with another great story. Victoria, thank you. thanks again for joining me. Thank you. Love you. And